Thank you all. I'm humbled by that. Thank you, John Luca. Um, yes, buy the book. That'd be great. <laughs> um, but let me just open us in prayer and thank you so much. Heavenly Father, we are humbled in your presence. We are humbled by your word and we are humbled to be with you. We ask now that you would encourage our hearts. We thank you for giving us your word. We thank you for the treasures that are in your word. We pray now that you would open our eyes and our hearts and our minds to be filled with your goodness and these visions that you give us from revelation of your exalted splendor and glory. And we pray these things in your precious name, Lord. Amen. Can everyone hear me okay? We're okay on volume and stuff like that? Okay, good, good, good. I'm in a new location. Actually, it's a smaller room, so maybe it'll echo less. And also, I'm gonna screen share. Do I have the ability to screen share? Yeah? I think so. I'm gonna um, put some PowerPoints up. Well, I wanna just start by saying, I think there's something fitting about talking about the kingdom of God and politics on April 15th. Um, as you know, this is the day when taxes were due, but we are not in normal times. And I just kind of uh, felt like I needed to acknowledge that and also to acknowledge our unusual circumstances. I know that uh, Dr. Worley and both uh, Dr. Jip um, mentioned that you know, when we agreed to this series, none of us ever, ever, ever could have imagined the, the circumstances under which we would be giving uh, these talks to our very, very beloved Mosaic community. So I, you know, God is good. God is good. He knew. He knew. And I just want to kind of recap. Um, two weeks ago, so we're, we're in Rome. Now we're dealing with the, the empire of Rome. And two weeks ago, Dr. Worley gave us some really good insights about how Jesus interacted with the Roman Empire. And last week, as we were reminded again earlier, Dr. Jip gave a fantastic job of how the early church engaged with the Roman Empire. Um, I loved the focus on things that we could do, so I'm just going to recap those in his own words, but the focus on economic generosity and justice, solidarity with the vulnerable and disenfranchised, and eschatological hope in the midst of our griefs and laments. Um, so the, I'm drawing upon that, because what I'd like to do is to talk about um, kind of two interwoven themes, but themes of having to do with justice and eschatological hope, and both of those are foundational in the book of Revelation. And I wanna just make a few comments, opening comments about Revelation. Some of you have had me in, you've heard this in class, so forgive me, you're gonna hear it again, but I like to joke that um, Revelation might have something to say about eschatology, which of course is the study of end times, but it really has far less to do with eschatology than most people think. Um, it's not a code book. Uh, we can't decipher it to find the Antichrist, which, by the way, is not even mentioned in Revelation. That's a term that comes out of 1 John. And we can't use it to determine the exact date and time that the world is going to end. So if it doesn't have to do with eschatology, then I would like to suggest that what Revelation really has to do with is ethics. And it's asking very ethical questions that need to be seriously considered. To whom do we give our allegiance? Whom do we worship? Whom do we serve? I mean, those are the key questions, and that's why Revelation was written. So with that kind of in the backdrop, I want to talk about three points, and I'm going to default. I'm going to uh, heavily rely on scripture, so I'm, I put that on a PowerPoint. Um, so let me do this. And oops, uh, let me share my screen first. Sorry, we're still navigating some of this technology, but I'm gonna share my screen and okay. And then I'm gonna maximize it. Um, I am so sorry, you guys. Okay, there we go. So now you can hopefully see it. Um, you may have to adjust your pictures, but the three points that I wanna focus on today is Jesus is the justice of God, and he is in our very midst. And I also want to talk about there's a cosmic reality behind all injustice. So our battle is not against flesh and blood. And the ultimate victory is never in doubt. The battle has already been won. So those are the three key points that I want to make. And we're going to quickly go through large chunks of Revelation, but I wanted to use three different parts of Revelation to illustrate each of these three points. So we're going to look at the first one, and that is that Jesus is the justice of God. And this is going to be out of Revelation 1, verses 12 to 20. If you have Bibles, you can read along. I will read from this. I'm actually going to read from my uh, notes because 
you all are blocking my lovely i mean how wonderful to have the people of god interspersed with the word of god that is the best but let me read this passage quickly i turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me and when i turned i saw seven golden lampstands and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest the hair on his head was white like wool and white as snow and his eyes were like blazing fire his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters in his right hand he held seven stars and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance welcome to to revelation this is all symbolic language and this is the opening vision of the risen lord jesus that is really the foundation for the rest of the book each one of these symbols highlights some aspect of the nature of uh, Jesus. So I'm just going to, if you look at the text, I'm going to just talk about these quickly. But the robe and the golden sash in verse 13 stress that he is the king and the priest. The white hair in verse 14 draws upon Daniel 7 to stress his wisdom and purity. His eyes blazing indicate his omniscience. He sees everything, nothing escapes his notice. In verse 15, the feet like glowing bronze stress that his absolute strength and stability and the rushing waters portray the awe-inspiring and compelling nature of, his, uh, of all that he says. In verse 16, the image of holding stars in his hands indicates sovereign protection. And we're gonna come back to this point. The double-edged sword is a symbol of judgment, recalling the emperor's so-called absolute right uh, for capital punishment, the right over power and life. But here it indicates Jesus's perfect justice that he alone has power over life and death. And this perfect justice comes from his mouth, which is indication that his words that proceed from his mouth unlike the imperfect justice of the roman empire that was deceptive or unjust or any other human ruler what comes out of his mouth is absolute perfect justice and notice finally the the incredible glory that's associated with him um like greater than the sign and shining sorry, i can't even say it greater than the shining sun which i'm getting a glimpse of so that was great timing but I want to just kind of underscore that all of the images here are stressing Jesus's perfection, his justice, his glory, his sovereignty, his power, his might, his splendor. I mean, we are invited to worship and all of these images are drawing us into worship. And then go back to the very beginning of uh, verse 12, notice that Jesus is standing among the lampstands. We're going to come back to that as well. So let's go to the next part of this uh, chapter one uh, passage, and I'll just uh, read it quickly. When I saw him, I fell at his feet, though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and uh, Hades. Write there for what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars is this, um, that you saw in my right hand, and then the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So a lot to unpack, but I want to just stress that, you notice, again, John, John's response, he falls down as if dead. This is the, the normal response, quote unquote, of how humans, when they uh, are visited by an angel, how much greater is what John is seeing? Not an angel, but the risen Lord Jesus. And here we get Revelation interpreting itself. And here we're told that the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches and that Jesus is holding them. Um, and that the lampstands are the seven churches themselves. So the seven churches are seven historical churches. Um, if you want, we can, I, I may be leading a, a tour there next year, a little promo, if you wanna go to the seven churches. Seven historical churches, but seven is the number of perfection and completion. So it's really talking about the church universal throughout all of time and all of space. And what is so remarkable about this is that the angels indicate uh, heavenly spiritual protection. 
Jesus is holding them. That's a sign of sovereignty and protection as well. So this whole opening picture is a picture of how God is protecting the church. And the greatest image, and this is what I want to stress here, is that the risen Lord Jesus is standing in the midst of the lampstands. He is in the midst of the church. He is not far away, somehow up there, far removed from our realities on earth. He is standing in our very midst. And this is another way of talking about the reality that we are his body and that he dwells in us. This is such powerful imagery. But also the lampstands is a reminder that the calling of the church is to be the light to the world, reflecting Jesus as the light of the world. And this is a high calling. So I think this has profound implications for how we think about justice, um, and particularly in light of our current realities. The expression that I'm using, Jesus is the justice of God, comes from an article that I read by the theologian Stanley Harawas. And this is my way of describing his main point. But justice is not something we do, but rather justice is who we are as the body of Christ. And the reason why I think that's so important is that as we engage the practices that Dr. Jip talked about last week, we are bringing the very justice of God into those situations because we are the body of Christ and Jesus is standing in the midst of his church. There can be no true justice apart from Jesus. He alone can render perfect judgment and he alone is justice. And this is the justice that we absolutely claim and understand confronts evil the evil of systemic oppression, the evil of poverty, and of every injustice in every imaginable form. So I want to just underscore in this first point that justice is a person, the risen Lord Jesus who stands in our very midst. Let's move to the second point. And that is understanding the cosmic reality behind all of this. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. And here's a passage that I won't go through in as much detail and a little bit hard to understand in some respects, but really a very, very helpful passage for giving us our eternal perspective. So let me read it. And a great sign appeared in heaven and a woman clothed the sun and the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven an enormous red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment he was born. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place pre prepared for her by God, that she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Lots of things to discuss here and lots of debate about the identity of the woman, but I think we're best uh, served by looking at Isaiah, where Zion is depicted as a woman and as a mother. And what this is giving us a picture of is the woman as the people of God. The moon under her feet symbolizes the dominion that was originally given to humanity. And the 12 stars, I think, very easily are understood as the 12 tribes of Israel. In the prophets, childbirth is often used to symbolize a time of tribulation. And that's what it's doing here. So the woman's labor symbolizes the tumultuous period leading up to the birth of Jesus, the Messiah. But I think this also gives us some imagery of Eve, alluding back to Eve, who gave birth to the line that would be the one who would crush the serpent's head. So it's very rich imagery that's given to here, us here. The red dragon is clearly Satan, and red emphasizes the essence of his nature, and that's murder and death. So red symbolizing blood. Uh, the seven heads indicate his universal scope, but they are a counterfeit to the true symbolism of seven as perfection or completion. The 10 heads draw from Daniel and the crowns, uh, I think really indicate his presumption, his self exaltation. So this is a gruesome, gruesome parody of the lamb 
who has seven horns that are symbolizing his perfect authority. And unlike the lamb who is exalted because he gave his very life, here we have a counterfeit image where Satan gains his power by intimidation, deception, and murder. So instead of giving his life, he takes life. And we see that every single thing that is this passage is talking about is how he's trying to thwart the purposes of God. So in highly compressed language, highly symbolic language, we see that the, the goal of Satan has always been to destroy the one whom God, uh, who came forth from the people of God, the people of God and the Holy Spirit, to rescue humanity. And the, the singular focus of the dragon has been to kill that child. Think about King Herod killing all of the male babies. Think about all of the plots on Jesus' life during his public ministry. And think about, finally, his execution on a cross. All of those were satanic efforts to thwart the perfect plan of God through Jesus Christ. But he's defeated. He's utterly defeated. Um, and yet, so what we see, and what I love about verse 5, is verse 5, in half a verse, compresses all of Jesus' life, it, uh, earthly incarnation. So it's, and what's really being emphasized here is the snatching up as a picture of God's sovereignty. Even though Satan was doing everything to kill Jesus, God's sovereignty always, always had in view Jesus' uh, exaltation and ascension. Then we find also a very interesting part here is that if he can't kill the Messiah, then his fury and wrath is going to be turned on the people of God. And that's verse 6. But some of the things that's really interesting about verse 6 is it talks about the wilderness as a place prepared for God. So uh, that time when she's being, when the, the people of God are being pursued by the evil one, they are in the place that God has already prepared for them. And then the reference to 1,260 days from Daniel, but it's meant to indicate that the time of their persecution is bounded. It's known. It's not going to go on forever. It's, it's understood as a bounded time period. So what I want to stress about this passage is that this shows us the cosmic reality behind all injustice. As I said, our battle is, this comes of course out of 1 Corinthians, our battle is not against flesh and blood and, and uh, Romans 6, I mean Ephesians 6, excuse me. Um, but we have to understand there is one who hates God and hates his people with a fury that cannot be quenched. Therefore, he hates God's justice. This is the one who is utterly opposed to everything that is good and perfect. But this is important to get. He can only counterfeit legitimate authority. He does not have legitimate authority, and he can only counterfeit what is truly the risen Lord Jesus's. He can put crowns on his head and claim authority, but it's counterfeit. It's illegitimate. One thing that strikes me as I go through Revelation and all of Scripture is that Satan cannot create he can only pervert. He can only distort what God has created. And that's a really key thing to understand. Now, in the context of the book of Revelation, what this passage is doing, it's, it's followed. Here's the dragon. In chapter 13, it's followed by the two beasts. That is the counterfeit trinity. Okay, so a mockery of the triune God. Now we have the dragon and the two beasts. But what it's doing is it's exposing the narrative that the Romans presented. And they did this very powerfully in architecture and in coins. And this is their narrative, that the Roman Empire alone brought peace and prosperity, that they were the very center of the universe. And in fact, they sustained the universe. The emperor was the savior of the world, the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. But here in this passage, John is exposing this for what it really is. It is a counterfeit narrative by a counterfeit king who is ruling a counterfeit kingdom. Everything here is underscoring the counterfeit. The true power of the Roman Empire was actually Satan himself, the murderer and the deceiver. And I would like to suggest that we are surrounded by counterfeit narratives and counterfeit kingdoms and counterfeit kings who rule over their kingdoms with injustice and deception. These counterfeit kings and kingdoms create systems that oppress and exploit people. 
and they create counterfeit narratives to support their oppressive systems and institutions. So we are called to have discernment and to recognize the true force behind these systems and to expose them. We are engaged in a spiritual battle and our enemy is not other human beings, deceived and corrupt as they can be, but our enemy is Satan himself. Um, and the encouragement is he is defeated and his terrorizing reign will not last forever. So this brings me to my final point, which is gonna take us to another complex passage. And that is Revelation 19, the complete and total victory of Jesus. Let me just read this. I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called faithful and true. With justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. Can't be numbered is his authority. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the, uh, God Almighty and on his robes and on his thigh, there, this name was written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I'm not gonna go through this in any detail at all, but I just wanna emphasize that every single symbol, every single image in this passage depicts Jesus's complete victory. The sword imagery we're seeing again. In the rest of Revelation 19, we're gonna see that Jesus strikes down the two beasts and ultimately Satan with a word. And I think there's an illusion here that just as Jesus created the world with a word, so also he eradicates evil and the evil one with a word, all powerful. This is not a battle in which we're trying to figure out who's, what the outcome is. Actually, if you read carefully in Revelation 19, the battle's won before it starts. And that's the point of the passage is to underscore Jesus's victory. Also, I just wanna point out too that in verse 11, Notice that Jesus alone can wage this battle because he alone is justice. He is the only one who can ultimately wage and win this battle because of his justice. Now, I often like to uh, say that the book of Revelation, as complex as it is, can be summarized in two words, two words for all of Revelation. God wins. God wins. And this is the good news of this passage. In the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of evil, in the midst of deception, in the midst of injustice of every kind, God wins. There is no question about his victory. We don't see it now fully. And in fact, sometimes we're tempted to see, say that we don't see it at all. But this victory is more certain than anything that we are experiencing right now. God wins. This is an encouragement to those who are oppressed, and it is a warning to those who oppress. God wins. Amen and amen and amen. I cannot stress this enough how encouraging this is. So I am really praying that these glimpses from Revelation encourage us and that give us the perspective that we need in order to engage our world. You know, I, sometimes people say that Christians are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. But I think it's just the opposite. I think that when Christians are focused on heavenly realities, that the risen Lord is standing in our very midst, that there is a cosmic spiritual battle behind every form of evil and injustice, and that God alone is utterly and ultimately victorious, then and only then can we be of earthly good. Then we know how to appropriate the spiritual weapons that God has given us to pray down strongholds and to courageously advocate for the oppressed, to freely help and give the poor. We are no longer deceived by counterfeit narratives when we are heavenly minded. This is uh, how we see reality as it truly is. And I would suggest that it is only when we are heavenly minded that we can give our full allegiance to the risen Lord Jesus and to worship him alone. Friends, God wins, we can be encouraged, and he is right here in our very midst. Praise God, hallelujah.
Amen.